The Road to Slavery Willie Lynch was a slave owner in the early 1700s. In fact, lynching was named after him. He taught others how to make and break slaves. Some of the key points he put was to foster distrust, did matter what, young versus old, male versus female, light-skinned slaves versus dark-skinned slaves. The key was to divide it and conquer. Another key insight he had was to have the woman rely on the master, not the man. If you emasculate the man and you put the woman in charge, you're in good shape as a slave owner. Destroy their language. Use hog pen instead of house for the place that they live in. Uh, they understood that the, the, if you limit their, their language, the, you limit their ability of thought. And if you can demoralize their language, you can demoralize them. If you treated them like a slave and, and like an animal and acted like that and made them refer to themselves as that, that's exactly how they would see themselves. We reverse nature by burning and pulling a civilized nigger apart and bullwhipping the other to the point of death, all in her presence. By her being left alone, unprotected, with the male image destroyed, the ordeal caused her to move from her psychological dependent state to a frozen independent state. In this frozen psychological state of independence, she will raise her male and female offspring in reversed roles. For fear of the young male's life, she will psychologically train him to be mentally weak and dependent, but physically strong. Because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offspring to be psychologically independent. And what have you got? You've got the nigger woman out front and the nigger man behind and scared. This is a perfect situation of sound sleep and economics. And again, that's Willie Lynch. And I apologize for the language, but I wanted to quote for what it is. And you can see that even in modern roles today. I mean, uh, the outspoken black woman is a common thing. And yet the, the black men are, tend to be more soft-spoken and physically strong. And yet when you see that 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 dynamic was enforced on us by by slave owners i mean it's such a powerful thing to to be able to do that and what they did for the black race with the slaves they're planning for us now they want to keep us dumb docile they want us unhealthy they want us feeding food they want us to feel that you know the world's coming at them and there's it's all a coincidence and there's nothing we can do about it these are key insights that i need you to understand I was trying to figure out which is worse, ignorance or apathy. Then I realized I don't know and I don't care. That's how the elite want us. Language enslaves you. By limiting language, you limit thoughts. By limiting thoughts, you limit threats to the establishment. Politically correct speech is the new speak from 1984. Phrases like making the world safe for democracy is really just bringing in dictators. If you look at our foreign policy throughout the United States you know, the last 50 years, we don't support democracies or constitutional republics or free markets. We support strongmen and dictators and drug lords. Or how about this? Uh, home, home ownership for everyone. We pushed home ownership with these mortgages and drove up the property prices. And all we did was further indebt ourselves to debt slavery. Cash for clunkers. Here's another program. You know, we gave all these government subsidies for people to, who own their cars outright. Maybe they were high mileage. Uh, maybe they didn't have much, uh, you know, retail value. But they served their purpose. They got people to where they wanted to go. They didn't cost a lot of money. And they were paid for. And what did we do? We, we enticed a whole group of people to uh, get rid of their car payment. Uh, now buy a brand new car. And we ended up destroying, uh, you know, thousands of, of viable cars that could have come onto the market and provide uh, cheap transportation for a lot of other people. Uh, we use credit, and really it's debt. And we use debt, and it's really slavery. You know, these are all uh, ways that our language limits us. Like assault weapon, that's another perfect example. I mean, that's been ingrained in our society to think that it's an assault weapon. And it really isn't an assault weapon. It's a rifle. I'm not going to necessarily assault somebody with it, but they, they, took the, the, they took the beginning power of naming it and, re, and, and forcing that into our, uh, our lexicon. Where are we going? I believe that that depends on us, that that's not in the cards. It's not in, uh, we are masters of our own destiny. But if you take the road we have been on, we are heading toward a destruction of our free society and toward a totalitarian society. We are unfortunately headed down the route 
which Chile has already taken a century to its end, which Britain has taken much farther than we are. Now, I ho uh, we still have time to avoid it, but we will not avoid it unless the people of this country recognize the danger and take very difficult and important steps to set a limit on the extent to which they are going to permit government to interfere with their lives. And before we can take steps to limit, we have to see how it progresses. The Road to Serfdom by Friedrich von Hayek is a very influential book that details how a free, a free society can trip into serfdom. We kind of looked a little bit how Germany took, you know, went from their Christian constitutional republic and within five to ten years went to became a fascist killing machine. The Road to Serfdom detailed that for the American experience. And there is this great summary, and this was published in a magazine a while ago that kind of summed up the whole book. But the first step is war forces national planning to permit total mobilization of our country's economy. You gladly surrender many freedoms. You know regimentation was forced by your country's enemies. So you, you work hard to, you know, to keep your team going. Number two, many want planning to stay. Arguments for a peace production board are heard before the war even ends. Wartime planners who want to stay in power encourage the idea. What's good in war is good for good in peace. So that's propaganda starting to sink into your into your mind, where you are willing to sacrifice for a war, but they want to start planning that you then sacrifice for them in peace. The planners promise utopias. A rosy plan for farmers goes well in in rural areas, and a plan for industrial workers is popular in cities, and so on. And many of these new plan planners are elected to office. But they can't agree on one utopian idea. With peace, a new legislature meets, but when the war, un unity is gone. The planners now nearly come to blow. Each has its own pet plan and won't budge. And you'll see this with the Democrats and the Republicans. You know, during the war, they're always united, uh, united front. Um, as their country goes off to war, we don't ask questions. We just support the troops. And anybody who asks uh, ask any questions is a traitor and... And stuff, but once the war's over, now now it's a rush to to secure their power base, and citizens can't agree either. When the planners finally patch up a temporary plan months later, citizens in turn disagree. What the farmer likes, the factory worker does not like. Planners hate to force agreement. Most national planners are well-meaning idealists and balk at the idea of using any force. They hope for some miracle that public agreement for their patchwork plan. Number seven. They try to sell a plan to all. In an unsuccessful effort to educate people to uniform views, planners establish a giant propaganda machine, which the coming dictator will find very handy. The gullible do find agreement. Meanwhile, growing national confusion leads to protest meetings. The least educated, thrilled and convinced by fiery oratory, form a party. Confidence in planners fade. The more that the planners improvise, the greater the disturbance to the normal business. Everyone suffers. People now feel rightly that the planners can't get things done. Number 10. A strong man is given power. In desperation, planners authorize a new party leader to hammer out a plan and force its obedience. Later they think that they'll dispense with them, or so they think. And this is kind of where we are now. Bush left us with the economy uh, starting to falter after incredible amounts of of uh, stimulus and, and government debt spending, and I, I feel at the at the very core of this, Obama has been set up to be the fall guy. Uh, for Hillary to walk away from uh, her political aspirations at that Bilderberg meeting in Chantilly, Virginia, in 2008, I really feel that uh, Obama is going to take the fall for this economy to fall apart. And uh, while I'm not concerned about Obama, you know, becoming you know this socialist leader and and all this government regulations and stuff I am more concerned with the guy that's coming after him because our military would never commit uh, crimes against its citizens under the auspices of a democratic uh, liberal leader but when the economy starts falling apart and everything starts falling apart the Republicans are gonna push forward some guy I don't know who it is some guy who's going to be the strong man to pull it all together. And he's going to talk about, you know, bringing things back to basics with the Constitution and sacrificing and, and all this stuff. And he's going to have a lot of pretty oratory. 
But that guy next is our next Hitler. Um, Hitler only came to power because of the German government went through a hyperinflation that destroyed every fabric of society. And, and, and Hitler promised and, and delivered um, a new Germany uh, that was strong and powerful and competent. And all Germans had to do was just give him total control. And that's what we're going to go through. Our country was strong. It's going to fall apart. Everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, with the dollar crashing, social services, everything. Just It's going to fall apart. It, it has to. And out of that ashes, you're going to see somebody come to power who's going to say, I'll get us back to where we were. Just The only thing I'm asking for is unlimited power. And that's when this dictatorship is going to come through full force. The party takes over the country. By now, confusion is so great that obedience to the new leader must be attained at all costs. Maybe you join the party itself to aid in national unity. Number 12. A negative aim welds the party unity. Early step of all dictators is to inflame the majority in a common cause against a scapegoat minority. In Germany, the negative aim was anti-Semitism. I can see in this future that it, we're talking about with a, you know, a strong man here, I could totally see this guy using all the illegal immigrants in this country as their scapegoat. Uh, we'll have mass deportations and you know, looking into people's uh, lives and, and, and no privacy because of, because of all these illegal aliens that quote unquote ruin the economy. Meanwhile, all these illegal immigrants are here, well, for a lot of deep reasons, but they're certainly not the cause of our problems. They're the symptom of the problem. And the, sim the cause of the problems is the elite that uh, laid the framework for this to al allow to happen. Number 13, no one opposes the leader's plan. It would be suicide. A new secret police, the new secret police are ruthless. The ability to force obedience always becomes number one virtue in the planned state. Now all freedoms are gone. Your profession is planned. The wider job choice promised by a now defunct planners turns out to be a tragic farce. Planners never have delivered and never will be able to. Your wages are planned. The division of the wage scale must be arbitrary and rigid. Running a planned state from a central headquarters is clumsy, unfair, and inefficient. Your thinking is planned. In a dictatorship, unintentionally created by the planners, there is no room for difference of opinion. Posters, radio, press all tell the same lies. Number 17. Even your recreation is planned. It is no coincidence that sports and amusements have been carefully planned in all regimented nations. Once started, the planners cannot stop. Uh, you saw a lot of uh, Hitler's uh, youth brigade. Um, they, you know, while on the outset they're all physically fit, but the reason why the elite did this is because they wanted physically fit uh, soldiers to fight their wars, and they couldn't have a weak populace fighting their wars. Finally, your discipline is even planned. If you're fired from a job, it's apt to be by a firing squad. What used to be an error has now become a crime against the state. Thus ends the road to serfdom. Once that slippery slope is, you know, once you go down that road, it's a long way to the bottom. This is a uh, political cartoon from 1934 in the Chicago Tribune, and it says, a planned economy or planned destruction. And here it shows a bunch of uh, young pinkies for Columbia and Harvard depleting the resources of the soundest government in the world. And they're throwing, they're drunk on power, that's where he says whoopee, and they're throwing the money all over the place. And a plan of action for the United States, spend, 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 under the guise of recovery, bust the government, blame the capitalists, blame the capitalists for the failure, jump the constitution, and declare a dictatorship. It worked in Russia. And and that's and that's what we well, that's what we're going through now. We're going through the final throes of um, state capitalism, and they're blaming the free market capitalism for the problems. And when in reality, the government is the one that's out of control, spending money. The fascist corporations are holding us all together. And when everything is done and the economy collapses, the communists and socialists and collectivists will universally say it was free market capitalism that caused all this pain and the only way out is give us all your power and we will we will save the day and that's what our plan is and that's what they're going for right now once the ruling members of the CFR have decided that the United States government should adopt a particular policy 
the very substantial research facilities of the CFR are put to work to develop arguments, both intellectual and emotional. Again, touching on that irrational aspect of us. The elite know this very well and they, and they use it to their advantage over us. To support the new policy and to confound and discredit intellectually and politically any opposition. That was former insider Admiral Chester Ward who testified that to Congress.